Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you. Here you get the start the recording for us. And um, we'll just welcome everybody. Everybody's just coming in. Welcome to the webinar, the Community Eye Health Journal Child Eye Care webinar. Um, we'll just get everybody a minute to, to come in the room and then I'll hand over to Aisha and we'll start the recording. So yeah, get comfortable. Welcome. I think this is a good place to start here. Would you please start the recording and then um, Aisha, please, please take it away from here. Thank you. Recording started, so yeah, we're good to go. Great. So thank you, everyone. I'm really um, delighted to welcome you here today to this important webinar alongside Almin, um, our editor of the Community Eye Health Journal. Um, today, we're going to be covering key topics from our recent issue of the Community Eye Health Journal on improving eye care for children. We're joined by a list of experts, which you can see on the screen, um, which I'll be introducing um, as we go through the webinar. Um, they will be presenting their articles from the journal, uh, and so we'll be covering topics from cerebral visual impairment um, through to common eye conditions. Um, I know that much of our audience uh, and our participants joining have also got a real wealth of experience in child eye health, so I really would like to encourage you all to introduce yourselves firstly in the chat saying who you are and where you're based and what your role is and then if you could post um, your questions in the question and answer box throughout the webinar you can do that for um, the speakers individually and you can also do that for the panel in general for the end so i will just um get started with the first of all just introducing i hope all of you already know about the community eye health journal um, it's our only free peer-reviewed journal, which is really focused on practical eye care delivery. It's for eye care workers of all levels. Um, it's available online um, in apps and also in print. And it's got a wealth of information in all its past issues, um, as well as keeping everyone up to date in all the current and recent issues as well. So today, today our webinar is very timely because it is World Sight Day. And the theme for this year is Child Eye Health with the slogan, Children Love Your Eyes. And this is really focusing on the message that eye health services should be accessible, available and affordable for all children. So um, Child Eye Health is an issue um, I'm very passionate about alongside everyone here in this webinar and many of you joining. Hence the theme of our webinar today is based on this issue which we recently published and which I encourage you all to read on improving eye care for children. And why are we focusing on this? Well, we're focusing because um, child health, health is so important with children's vision under five years old being very critical in particular. And children are um, extremely different to adults. Um, children's vision is still developing from their birth to seven years old. And they really need to be able to see in order for that vision to develop. So timing and timely diagnosis is really critical. We can see here um, also um, that delayed treatment in children can really have a huge impact for them in every aspect of their development. So not only does it lead to worse vision, uh, but it leads to worse development outcomes overall. And in the case of retinoblastoma it can also lead to premature um, death of a child. Um, we continue to have um, many challenges in child eye health. We know that eye care services for children are limited or non-existent in many low-income settings, particularly in rural areas. And these <clears throat> children often present really late to eye care services, sometimes many months and even years after um, a parent or a carer may have noticed the problem. And even when they present, they may not reach someone who specialized in child eye health or who knows all the key signs. So this hence means um, that there's still a huge burden of both preventable and treatable blindness in children. As this graph shows in, in both the lower and middle income settings. And therefore it's really critical for us um, in the eye health community to have the knowledge and tools to both diagnose, manage and advocate for these children. I now want to get straight into um, handing over to our speakers who will be um, 
uh, highlighting our key topics. Our first speaker for today is Dr. Richard Bowman. He's a consultant paediatric ophthalmologist at Great Ormond Street Hospital and an associate professor at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Richard is um, an expert on CVI and retinoblastoma, and he'll be talking today about CVI. So I will now hand over straight to Richard. Great, thanks very much. Um, and it's great a great message, children love your eyes, but actually vision really occurs in the brain, not in the eyes. Um, and the, the commonest cause of um, I think you're you're rushing through a bit too quickly there, Aish. Oh, sorry. The, the commonest cause of visual problems in children these days, really in all parts of the world, is actually problems with the brain, the visual pathways in the brain. 50% of the brain is used for processing vision. Um, and we're, the main relay station is here in the middle of the brain, um, in the thalamus, the lateral geniculate nucleus, and we're talking about problems behind that in the posterior visual pathways. Next slide, please. So we're talking about children who've got poor vision, but fairly normal looking eyes. And how do we make a diagnosis in practice um, of CVI in a busy clinic? And first of all, you're looking for a, a risk factor, a neurological history. So maybe the child was very premature or they had problems at birth, they needed a, a long time on special care baby unit. Um, that's the first thing. Can we go back one? Secondly, have they got typical symptoms of visual problems in everyday life? And thirdly, can we measure some problem with vision? And these children may have neurodevelopmental uh, delay and they may be quite difficult to assess vision formally. So, uh, um, but I'm going to take us through how to do it. And I, for me, I like to have two out of those three factors to make a diagnosis of CVI. Next slide, please. Um, and the prevalence is higher than we think. As I say, it's the commonest cause of visual impairment, probably one in every um, primary school class child um, has CVI in the UK from uh, population based studies. And we have less information in middle and low income countries. This slide, um, just go forward again. This slide shows that, that um, on the uh, left, that it is increasing in uh, frequency, in prevalence in the UK. Why? Because we're saving more premature babies or babies that have a stormy birth, but we don't prevent the morbidity, the brain damage that goes with it. Next slide, please. Um, and here are just some of the, the differences in the causes of cerebral visual impairment between higher and lower income countries. And that mainly relates to the fact that premature, extremely premature babies who are at high risk are less likely to survive in low income countries. And obviously malaria would be more of an issue um, in Africa. Next, please. Here are some scans of a typical neonatal encephalopathy. Um, <laughs> next one, please. And, and neonatal hypoglycemia, which has a predilection for the back of the brain, the where the occipital lobes are. Next one, please. So it's a, it can be a complicated um, picture when you have a child who maybe has some general developmental delay. They can't tell you what they're seeing. Um, how do you decide if they've got CVI or not? And I just want to take us through three basic ideas. Just because this child is complex and has communication problems, don't forget the basic clinical tools as a healthcare professional. Take a history to find out if there is a risk factor in the history. These typical symptoms, fluctuating vision. Vision fluctuates more when it's a brain problem than when it's an eye problem. It may vary if the child's more tired or if they're sick or if they're having seizures. They may be... Uh, uh, adopting close viewing, they may bring objects close to them. That may be because their acuity is low, so they have to make things larger. But it may be because they can't see a cluttered visual environment. So they're, by bringing things forward, they're, they're sort of screening out the visual clutter. Um, and the way that they use vision in everyday life, they use it to get around, to communicate with people. Um, think a little bit about the functional vision. Uh, as opposed to just what the acuity is in the clinic. Next, please. 
Um, and then the next after history is examination. And we should be able to make an estimate of quantifying visual acuity in children, even if they're pre-verbal or developmentally delayed. Um, and particularly if you do it in an environment where they're comfortable and they're used to perhaps in their school or even in their home. Um, and this slide shows me in Bangladesh uh, and one of my colleagues using preferential looking, using eye pointing. So children can't tell us which picture they can see, but we can uh, observe their eyes, eye pointing, it's called preferential looking, to get an idea of what their visual acuity is. Refraction, top left, we must, um, the brain controls the development of the refraction of the eye, and children with brain damage are more likely to need glasses. So it's a really important part of the assessment. Next slide, please. Um, and we did a big study in Nigeria, actually, where we found some children, their vision was um, with, uh, so poor, we, we couldn't even get a preferential looking acuity, like it's happening here. But we found, next slide, that if we held a mirror up, um, they would engage their face, at a, and, and the distance, um, you pull the mirror away from them, and when they disengage with their own reflection, that gives you a proxy for their visual acuity, and we published a paper on that. Next slide, please. Um, if you still can't get an objective measure of their vision, the, this questionnaire, next slide, has 10 questions about visual skills in everyday life. Back a bit, back a bit, back. That's it there. <laughs> Next. So there are 10, 10 skills there. And the score, when you add those up again, correlates with visual acuity. And then the fight and that one, uh, that one shows what we do at Great Ormond Street, which is we put electrodes on the visual brain and flash up patterns of different sizes. And we can get an idea of what the vision is from that as well. That won't be available to many of you. So even if a child can't tell you what they can see, they can't read down the optician's chart, there are well-established methods for measuring their vision. And it's important to do that, uh, not just think they're a disabled child that can't do it. Visual acuity is only one dimension of vision. Visual field is an important one. And we probably know that if we have right-sided brain damage, that causes a problem with the left visual field. The same is true up and down, and, and the superior part of the brain is more vulnerable to damage around birth, and so lower visual field loss is common, as shown in this picture here. Sometimes you can see it in the optic discs. This is important because it means children trip up over stairs and objects on the ground. Lower visual field is important also for reading. Next slide, please. Um, and that just shows the parietal lobes in the superior part of the brain are more vulnerable and bilateral parietal damage will cause inferior field loss, as shown in the last slide. Next slide. Um, and if you understand that, you can just clear the, the floor, um, teach children to look down, maybe get them to wear bright colored shoes, maybe give them a stick to, so they've got sensory communication with the ground. And just under, uh, doing your basic assessment can be transformative to improving the quality of life of the child because you understand what their visual problem is. Next, please. And we and we know here's a, so a left-sided occipital lobe lesion that's going to cause a problem with the right side of the visual field. Next slide. So people, the children will have a history of bumping into um, things on the right or not seeing things coming from the right. Children have a couple of adaptive responses to. Um, blindness on one side, we call it hemianopia. One is they'll turn their face to the affected sides, which may be an adaptive response or it may be um, an imbalance. Um, and the other one next is they'll sometimes diverge the eye, one of their eyes towards the side of the blind field. Next slide. Um, and so before you, yeah, before you operate on um, an exotroca in a child who has a hemianopia, check that it's not an adaptive response. This child is improving their binocular visual field by diverging the eye to the left. Um, next slide. There are a couple of um, habilitation um, programs for children with hemianopia. Um, there's some computer game-based programs um, on eye tracking. And we've recently done a trial at Great Ormond Street using prisms to expand the field that the children have liked a lot. Next slide, please. 
Um, we'll move on. Strabismus, just you can still get functional results from children with um, strabismus with CVI, so that can be helpful as well. Next, please. Next, let's just move on there. Now, glasses, I've mentioned this already. One of the main things we can do to make a difference for these children is make sure they're in the right glasses, that they're at higher risk of needing glasses because of their brain damage. And there's one specific problem they might get, which you might forget about, which is they can't accommodate. They can't change their focus from distance to near. And giving them near glasses, even as babies, may open up their world to see their mum's face for the first time, as shown in this slide here. This is a baby smiling at mum for the first time because we put her in reading glasses, essentially. And again, we've got a trial going to see how effective that is in London at the moment for young babies. Next one, please. So those, those things we're used to, visual acuity, visual um, field and um, refraction, uh, in the brain is where vision is used to help us communicate, to help us move our bodies around the world. Um, and to do that, we have to understand a little bit about the way the brain processes visual perception. Just one slide to summarize it. Next, please. Um, shows that, that that parietal lobe, the, up, the superior part of the brain, is responsible for the way we use vision to move our hands and feet without even thinking about it, to pick things up, to avoid obstacles in everyday life, and to move around. Whereas the lower or the ventral or the temporal stream is our traditional what pathway, enabling us to recognize objects and store memories um, and recognizing them again in the future. And we've got some questionnaires that probe into these different areas of which part of the brain may be damaged and which particular visual strengths and weaknesses might be um, arising from that. Next slide. And when you begin to understand that, take a detailed history, you can um, give specific bits of advice like I did earlier for a child with lower visual field loss. OK, next. And uh, just to finish with, what one um, general bit of advice for children with CVI is to declutter their visual environment as much as possible. Give them a plain surface with one object to play with because they, um, in a cluttered environment, their vision goes down. One extreme form of decluttering that we've been playing with um, is the monochrome tent or the orange tent where they're bathed in just one wavelength of light. And this is an example of one child that seemed to wait with severe CVI who just seemed to wake up visually. And if you just run through these next few slides for me, um, Aisha, just to show the child beginning to show, there's no attention, no looking up there. And then gradually 15 minutes a day in an orange tent, keep, keep going. Just run through them, um, keep going. He just began to lift his head and begin to look at his hands um, and become generally more attentive. And we think that's just because of decluttering. And we're, again, we're trying to get some trials going to see if we can measure this as a real effect. Just keep going to the end. Um, and just to finish with, if you're familiar, if you're not familiar with cerebral visual impairment, but you're familiar with cerebral palsy, it's a similar concept. It's brain damage causing movement problems in CP and causing visual problems in CVI. And a lot of children have both. So if you see a child with CP, think about how to assess their vision. That's it. Thank you very much. My time's up and um, I'm happy to take questions at the end. Great. Thank you very um thank you very much, Richard. Um and yeah, please do remember everyone um to post any questions. You can put them uh into the question. There's a separate question and answer box in the webinar. So if you um ask your questions there and then yeah, continue to introduce yourselves in the chat as well. Um we're now going to move on and I want to um very uh, happy to introduce our next two speakers. We have Dr. Shusheta Kulkarni. She is a, a consultant uh, ophthalmologist based at HV Desai Eye Care Institute in Pune in India. And also to introduce uh, Professor Dupe Adimola Papula. She is a pediatric consultant ophthalmologist at the University of Iloran in Nigeria. 
Um, both of them have done incredible work on Chihal Delft in their regions. And now they will both be speaking about common conditions, which is one of the calls to wrote together of the journal. So over to you both. Thank you, Aisha. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Sucheta Kulkani, and uh, I'm honored to be part of this uh, webinar today. Uh, I'm going to cover the first half of the presentation where we, we are going to speak about common eye conditions in children. Can I have my next slide, please, Aisha? Okay, so Aisha has already briefly uh, discussed why uh, visual uh, problems are, uh, you know, need urgent attention in younger age group because it's a very, very vital sense for overall uh, intellectual, emotional and social development for a child. Initial first a few years of the life are very crucial uh, for vision development. Uh, small children may not be able to communicate properly. They may not be in a position to articulate what is going wrong with their vision. And such uh, early vision loss, if it is neglected, it can lead to permanent visual disability. So basically never dismiss a parent who is suspecting that something is wrong with their child's eye, even though everything looks fine, you know, try and probe little more when you are examining a child. And in this uh, picture, in the slide, you can see uh, it's a pair of twins, uh, but you can see the girl uh, is obviously blind and she uh, also shows a delayed physical development. And the uh, twin brother is very well developed physically, emotionally, socially. So obviously because uh, she doesn't have visual stimulus, her uh, overall development has been delayed. Next slide, please. Okay, so before we start, let me just share the outline of our presentation. We are going to first cover uh, conditions affecting newborn and infants. Then we will go on to discuss about conditions affecting toddlers and uh, eventually older children. And lastly, we will be speaking about injuries and other common conditions uh, in children. Can I have my next slide, please? Okay. So uh, this is not so common in India, but I think it is seen in some of the other countries, other continents, uh, that is infection in a newborn baby, uh, which is called as ophthalmia neonatorum. Uh, the typical sign is, you know, swollen eyelids, thick yellow discharge within few days of the birth. It typically happens within a week of the birth. And the reason is uh, the baby catches infection from birth canal during delivery. Uh, Prevention, basically, uh, if there is any infection in the mother, in the birth canal, that has to be treated. But uh, if there is any active infection in the, in the baby, apply povidone iodine eye drops immediately uh, the moment you see that infection because this needs urgent attention. Uh, clean the eyes very frequently. And if there is any eye facility nearby, urgently refer such baby to uh, the facility preferably within a day on the same day always explain the risk of blindness to parents and a need of urgent referral and such babies may also need uh, antibiotics you know systemic antibiotics to take care of this infection next please uh Watering from the eyes is also uh, not so uncommon complaint in young infants. Typically, parents would uh, notice uh, continuous watering from the eyes after baby turns around one or one and a half months old. That's when uh, the tears start, uh, you know, forming. And uh, in such babies, there won't be any redness. It resolves. This, this is due to tear duct obstruction. The tear ducts are in the process of developing and sometimes the tear canal is very narrow. Uh, uh, it, it is yet to develop. That is why the tear, instead of going through the nose into the throat, comes out of the eye. And that is also called as epiphora. Uh, tear duct obstruction is uh, usually a self-resolving uh, condition in many babies. Gentle massage over the area between eyes and nose is something which can help. Uh, if you if a mother repeats it several times a day, it can help in uh, early formation of the tear duct. Uh, 
very rarely it can cause infection uh, in an obstructed tear duct which can lead to a painful swelling and pus collection here in this particular picture you can see a small swelling uh, underneath the right eye of this particular baby which is also called as dacryocele so such kind of infection when it develops it needs uh, urgent treatment with antibiotics and, it, and rarely when the tear duct obstruction is not resolved even after a few months or within uh, first year of the uh, life of the baby, then it may need a small uh, procedure called as lacrimal probing. Next, please. Okay. Uh, so next condition is uh, congenital glaucoma in which uh, the babies would typically present with uh, watering and cloudy looking corneas with enlarged eyes. In this picture, you can see the left eye of this baby. Uh, the cornea size is much bigger compared to the other eye. Also, uh, the cornea is uh, not very uh, transparent and uh, this thing, it is uh, showing cloudy uh, feature and the eye looks a little swollen. This condition can affect uh, either one eye or both eyes. Uh, initial symptoms are watering, initial signs are watering, occasionally redness, uh, eyes may look enlarged and parents initially sometimes may, if it is a bilateral disease, parents may think that, you know, eyes are very big, so they are beautiful, but eventually they may notice that child is very uncomfortable, especially in a bright light and seems to be in pain in an advanced disease and this disease can cause permanent blindness, hence it uh, needs urgent referral to an eye doctor, preferably within a week of the diagnosis. Thank you. Next. Okay. So, something white in the eye. Uh, white reflex in the eye can be due to several conditions, cataract being one of the common conditions. Uh, sometimes the babies are born with uh, cataract and here in this particular image you can see uh, the central part of the pupil is uh, seen white in both eyes and that is obviously due to cataract. But cataract can also develop after a few months or few years of the birth. In, the, in that case it is called as developmental cataract and typical signs would be baby may not make any eye contact uh, in a a uh, healthy newborn baby which is born at full term, uh, eye contact should start around two months of age. Between two and three months of age, baby starts making eye contact with the mother, starts with social smile. That may be absent in babies born with congenital cataract. Eyes may not be stable. Uh, eyes may show roving movements all the time. Sometimes they may uh, become cross. They may not uh, look straight. Uh, so, congenital cataract uh, urgently requires surgery because if uh, the patient does not need, uh, does not get any treatment for the cataract, the vision may remain poor permanently. So, urgent referral is required. Next slide, please. Uh, I think this is uh, the last slide uh, where I'm going to speak. So, something white in the eye, second condition is retinopathy of prematurity. Uh, this is typically seen in babies who were born too soon, Bo uh, those who were born before 34 weeks of gestational age or uh, those born with birth weight of less than 2000 grams or 2 kg. So back of the eye, that is retina, uh, eventually slowly gets detached. If uh, uh, because the baby is born prematurely, it may, it may fall sick and may require multiple interventions to make it survive. And uh, the sickness during the early stages after birth can uh, lead to uh, growth of the retinal blood vessels in the wrong direction, pulling the retina along, leading to retinal detachment and permanent vision loss. And while all this is happening inside the eye, the eye may look absolutely normal from outside. And that is why uh, it is very important to screen for this disease by visiting an ICU and uh, by using a special technique. Uh, Fortunately, uh, this uh, blindness is uh, preventable in a vast majority of children. And one thing, important thing to remember is first ROP screening for any preterm baby should happen before day 30 of life. If a screening is delayed beyond that, there are chances that baby may end up with complications of ROP. And in the advanced stages of, of ROP, when baby develops bilateral retinal detachment, that is when uh, one sees white reflex in the eye. But unfortunately, by then it is often too late to treat. Thank you. Next slide, please.
Uh, Dupe, are you going to take on from this slide? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yo. Uh, the organizer uh, for inviting us. So, Chester, thank you very much for the collaboration we have had from the publication up to this time. I appreciate it. Um, I'll be continuing with something white. If you host, please allow my video to come up. I'll continue with something white in the high. This time around is not a harmless condition. It is a cancer called retinoblastoma, which we often see in children who are five years or younger. And this shows first maybe as a squint, the eyes will be turning in mostly. If we don't pay enough attention, then we see glow in the night. From the glow in the night, we don't pay attention, we can have loss of vision, the eye can become shrunken. If we continue to waste time, it escapes from the eye, it goes into the bone of the eye, it pushes the eye out. From there, it goes to the brain and to other parts of the body. We don't want to get to that level. We want every parent to know when you see strabismus squinting high, know that as much as it may not be a cancer, cancer is a possibility, that child needs to get to the hospital within a week and get to the correct hospital so that we do not lose both the vision and the eye of the child. Please let's go on next slide. We'll be, talking, we'll be looking at white thin in the eye from another cause. This time around vitamin A deficiency, in which case often is related to measles when the child has diarrhea and is not feeding, is losing a lot of vitamin A from different body parts, from the skin, from the intestine, and is also not taking enough. Early on, it shows as the eye will become sore and invariably, if nothing is done at that time, we have a scar that shows as white in front of what is ordinarily transparent part of the eye. And if it becomes progressive without giving vitamin A, then we have difficulty in night vision. So what should we do? Every child should have measles in immunization. In Nigeria, and I know in many parts of Africa, immunization is given at nine months, and it's also repeated later. And when a child has measles infection, vitamin A supplementation should go as part of treatment for that child, even before any eye condition comes on. If the child is taking orally, the casco can just be broken and put on the child's mouth. If not taken orally, then an injection can be given. Whatever the case may be, if the eye is sore, is charging, urgent referral is required. My next slide is speaking about cross eyes. In cross eyes, we have the eye turning in or out. The truth is nobody really wants cross eyes. The eye should be looking straight when a child is six months of age. Any crossed eye beyond six months of age is something that requires attention. As I mentioned in my previous slide, it may be because there's a need for eyeglasses. It may be because there's a cancer in the eye. And it may be because there's excessive straining depending on the age of the child. Even though in some communities, they love to see squinting eyes, but we don't want squinting eyes because they are discriminated against. They have difficulties, many times keeping relationship is really something that requires restoration, is not rehabilitation. So it's cheaper to get that child fixed as young as the child may be then than to wait till the child is old and is struggling with all the effects of uh, squint or strabismus. The next slide is showing itchy eye that invariably becomes brown. And it's very common in our parts of the world. It changes with the season. It comes and becomes a lot as the season changes. It's often not going to cause loss of vision, but from the arm that is used to rub the eye, infection can come in. 
the cornea shape can change and all this can lead to loss of vision. But more importantly, in our part of the world, people have access at over the counter to steroid eye drops. And we have kids who have developed glaucoma just because they have an allergy. And so we want to pay attention to this that no, when a child has allergy, don't just go to over the counter, get to the hospital to get proper treatment. And my next slide is talking about high injury which most often comes from sharp objects or rubber lean, as they call it, rubber band that children used to play. The sharp object could be like blade, could be like scissors, could be like stick and cane when they want to play teachers because teachers carry stick around to get the children to do well. And without supervision of children, from the front of the eye, the cornea, up onto the retina could be damaged from ocular injury. We found out that it is responsible for about 40% of cataract surgeries we're doing in children. So that is a lot. And in these cases, they are often preventable if there had been adult supervision because they happen mostly at home and then in school. So anytime a child is holding anything sharp, please take away from that child. An adult, when you are holding anything sharp, it should be pointing down, not forward, not backward. Don't beat a child on the head. Hold the child if you must discipline a child in whichever way and avoid beating anyone on the head. And my next slide will also still be on injury. This sometimes happens from chemical injury used at home or at work site. We know in some places, even children, they work. They work at building construction sites and we have cement getting into the high. We have uh, domestic uh, lotions getting into the eye. The most important thing, anytime there is anything into the eye, wash that eye with at least a gallon of water with the eyes open and pour the water continuously. When this has been done, then the next thing is to go to the hospital. Because if we do not wash off what has poured into the eye, it will break down the eye tissues and destroy the eye. My next slide will be talking about the need to have eyeglasses. Children as young as two months old wear eyeglasses to be able to see better. Sometimes if we don't allow them, you see them holding things too close to the eye to read or go close to the television to be able to see. And some parents don't understand or they bump into things around the house or they try to frown to see better, squeezing their eye. Please, the earlier the child starts to wear glasses when required, the more likely the problem will get better over time. Otherwise, the brain gets suppressed. We just had a talk on CVR. Even in this one, the brain got, gets suppressed. Even with the glasses, they may not improve. Just simple wearing glasses is good for the high. Thank you so very much. So in concluding this talk, we will want to encourage you with my nice slide. to see. Let's pay attention to our children into their highs when they are young. Let's supervise them while they are at play. And when we detect that something doesn't look right, take them to the right place for early intervention. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Great, thank you, um, thank you very much um, to all our speakers. Thank you to Dupe, thank you to um, to Shetta and to Richard. Um, I will encourage you, I think all our speakers, if they can put their cameras on. And I'm also going to, um, again, just highlight to all our participants that we've got, that they can ask questions to our panel in the Q&A. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Professor Claire Gilbert, who is going to lead um, the questions to our panel and the discussion for the panel as well. Well, thank you very much indeed to um, our um, speakers. Can you, um, okay, okay. Can you reactivate my video, please? <clears throat> just so you can put it on, are there like the, the normal way you just put on the video? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, we've got two questions in the, um, the, the Q&A tab. Um, one of them is from Andrew Smith, and it's a question for Richard. Um, are you aware of any cost effectiveness 
studies that have been done for the management of children with CBI. And she makes a comment that maybe this is a, an important element to add into any other, to any clinical trials that are done. Yes, thank you for that question. We are, the, the, the trial I mentioned very briefly that we're doing in London at the moment, putting at-risk babies in reading glasses, has a health economics uh, dimension to it. So we're looking at whether they have any other contacts with the hospital, the cost of their health care between two, the two arms to see if it has an impact. Um, the the tent study, again, when we've argued for a bigger trial, we've argued that the cost of putting these severely disabled children in residential centres um, is so large um, and the communication problem so difficult that that a, a simple tent that costs about £50 to make would be very cost effective, but we haven't been able to measure that yet. But uh, thank you for the question. I think it's a very important aspect of future work. Oh, another question has popped up, but I'll go to the other one first. Um, one is from Musa Kurz, um, who is a nurse, and she is asking if anyone knows of any pediatric ophthalmologists in Palestine. So maybe if you do, you could put you could send uh, that in in the chat or in the in the Q and A, and then that that can that can be communicated. Thank you. Um, there's a question about um, what to do if the, the the eyes are still watering after the um, um, eye has been massaged, as you suggest. What's the next step? Okay, so I will take that. Thank you for the question. So typically, uh, the blocked duct uh, would uh, is like more likely to open by around an, uh, eight nine months of age. If the watering continues despite several uh, massages beyond that, then a small procedure called as lacrimal probing can help uh, increase the lumen of the tear duct and can take care of the blocked duct. It's a small procedure, but of course, it needs to be done under general anesthesia because the babies are, you know, small. But uh, in almost over 80% of the babies, the simple lacrimal massage for around six months of uh, duration would typically take care of the blocked duct. Thank you. Lovely. Um, thank you very much. Um, there's a question, another one for Richard, um, about children with um, CBI who also have epilepsy um, and is there any evidence whether good control of their seizures improves their their vision or visual functioning um good, yeah another good question I, i'm not sure there's any hard evidence for it but it's certainly been my experience in clinical practice that um if you can control epilepsy um you can often improve um visual behavior and we I, I showed you a, a briefly a slide of, of the visual evoke potential where we put electrodes over the primary visual cortex and measure response to visual stimuli and sometimes we get abnormal EEG responses interfering with that showing that the epilepsy is actually interfering with visual um, perception um, and the other thing to mention is that some of the anti-epileptic drugs can damage vision through retinal damage, Vigabatrin in particular, and they can make the ch children more drowsy and that can impair um, vision as well. Um, thank you very much. Um, I've got a, a question for Dushetta. I think you talked about the cataract. Can you just very briefly outline what the management of bilateral congenital cataract is, where and, and who should do it? Yes. Thank you. So, yeah, bilateral congenital cataract needs urgent intervention. Uh, typically, pediatric ophthalmic surgeons are uh, qualified and, uh, you know, uh, they are in a position to operate upon the, the cataracts. Uh, if a child is too young, if the surgery is happening within first year of the birth, then obviously uh, one cannot implant intraocular lens because the shape, uh, size of the eye keeps changing very rapidly in first few years. So uh, the primary intervention is just to remove cataract and keep the child aphakic and plan secondary intraocular lens procedure after a few months. 
and when the cataract is present in both the eyes, uh, some centers uh, perform simultaneous bilateral cataract surgeries on the same day, but most centers would uh, prefer to uh, operate the second eye within a week or so. So that is the typical management for cataract. And in uh, older uh, children, uh, such as toddlers and beyond, uh, the cataract surgery is always, uh, you know, uh, in the cataract surgery, of course, the primary intraocular lens implant would be done. Yeah. Thank you. Can you just briefly mention about follow-up? Yes, follow-up is actually more important than the surgery itself because uh, the refractive error, the spectacle number keeps changing very frequently. And it's very crucial that uh, you keep uh, checking on the child uh, every few months. There are other uh, second post-op complications uh, such as uh, secondary glaucoma, you know, intraocular pressures can go high and uh, that will not have any uh, sign. So baby may lose the eye, doesn't require, doesn't need, any, uh, doesn't get any treatment. So, and of course, if the refractive error is not corrected um, uh, uh, very frequently, the child may remain amyloepic for life. So, surgery would, uh, the, all the efforts of surgery would be in vain without any proper refractive uh, services. Yeah. Great. And thank you very much. Um, I've got a, um, another question for, for Richard. Um, the children with divergent strabismus, as a mechanism for increasing their field of vision. Yeah. So under those circumstances, if you can demonstrate that they have hemianopia, <clears throat> and this seems to be what's happening, would you advise against surgery, even if the parents are pushing for it for cosmetic reasons? Yeah, good question. So what I've done is I've, I've tried, and I've only done it in older children. I, I think the very first case I had as a consultant being listed by someone else, I canceled them, they were a younger child. Mm -hmm. Um, left exo and left hemiplegia and left hemianopia. But older ones, I put prisms up to simulate the effect of surgery and let them see. Because teenagers are obviously very concerned about the appearance of the eyes and their self-esteem. So that some of them will tolerate a bit of a reduction in visual fields in order to look straighter to their colleagues. So I have gone ahead and done it. In, um, I even had one who was a a national level disability athlete um, who had visual impairment and he had to run in lane without diverging to either side. So I was concerned. I didn't want to impair his um, performance, but he, he did fine with it. But you can simulate with a prism. Fine, that's good. Um, thank you very much. Um, the Richard, you seem to be getting the lion's share of the question. Um, how long does vision loss as a result of status epilepticus? take to recover? Um, I would say um, usually within a few hours. I mean, I, I one child that I worried about for a lot um, of time was um, a child that was completely blind and uh, he became completely blind and we could find nothing structural in his eyes or on his MRI, but his e.g. showed occipital epilepsy. And I always thought we'd see some improvements in his visual behavior with no structural damage there, but he remains blind to this date. And far, he's the only child I know that's completely blind just from epilepsy with no obvious structural damage to the um, mm. vi visual cortex. But, but in, normally after stasis epilepticus, it, it recovers um, gradually over a few hours. Thank you very much. Um, um, last chance, people, to put a question in the in the box. Um, I'm just going to ask a, a question now to Dupe. Um, <clears throat> seeing that managing children is so different from managing the eyes of um, of adults, um, in what way would does the services what 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 do the services look like in if you want to manage children in terms of the staffing and the equipment that you might need over and above that for adults. Could we just give a little indication of, of what you might need? All right, thank you very much. Because typically children don't complain, at least the young one, and uh, we also have had older children who didn't even know that poor vision is not right. They think that's the same, the way everyone sees. So we tend to need more social workers, social support, people would 
educate who would be deliberate about finding the children. Sometimes we have used different strategies to get this done. Using key informants is like one of these. One way we do it, they go into the communities to try to find the children. And of course, the important thing is also getting volunteers or support system to transport them to the hospital. Because unfortunately, it is what it is. In some cases, because the parents, they don't feel the pain or they don't understand or they've never seen a blind child, they don't believe. So they delay. So, but if they know that there's some support, it tends to also encourage them. So people that will bridge that gap between the hospital and the, the child, they are very important in the different way we manage them. Adults will come by themselves. If they have pain, they will come. If they don't see, they will come. When they are now in the hospital, we also need different layers of people. A lot of counseling, apart from the specialists, we have good nurses, we have good optometrists who are trained in pediatrics, you know, not just in adults. We need people who will continue to do the follow-up because uh, like Suchetta said, imagine that you've operated a child with cataract and the child has amblyopia to so have regular refraction every four to six months and the child doesn't come. It's like all your labor at surgery is wasted. So we need people who will bridge that gap to ensure that we keep seeing those babies. And of course, we all know that the things we use to manage children, they sometimes can be very expensive. Let's take the example for adults. You do straightforward cataract, no problem, but children, you need vitrectomy if they are very young so that they do not have capsular opacity. You also need people who maintain such things in any facility. And of course, somebody was asking about imaging. I saw that the question. When we when you use a regular tabletop camera, you can tell the adult, look up, look down, look right, look whatever, and you get a wide field of view picture. For children, it's not like that. We need a wide field camera. And most of them are very expensive. So I would say that the people in between the specialists, they are great people that we need from teachers to key informants to coordinators who will pick the children, help them to the hospital and follow up care. In addition to the expensive equipment we tend to use to manage them. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Adupe. And I think I probably to your list, I would add um, the need for pediatricians or access to pediatricians, because sometimes these children have other complex health problems. They need to be checked whether they're fit for anesthesia. Um, and also access to an, an anesthetist trained in, in looking in managing children as well. Thank you. So um, I've got another question for Sushetta, please. Um, what, are the, what are the possible causes of corneal opacity in a baby that's born preterm? And what could be done to help or restore or prevent blindness in, in a child who has this problem? Hmm. So there can be more than one uh, cause for the corneal opacities in preterm babies. Uh, uh, advanced retinopathy of prematurity, uh, if left untreated or undetected, can have effect on the front of the eye, that is cornea. And once the anterior segment get involved, gets involved, it can lead to corneal opacity, scarring, secondary glaucomas, etc. Uh, the second cause could be a rare congenital anomaly, which is called as Peters anomaly, where, uh, you know, cornea and the uh, iris is adherent to each other and baby is born with uh, white uh, opacity on the cornea. And uh, other possibilities, of course, retinoblastoma. Uh, again, advanced retinoblastoma leading to if, uh, effect on the anterior segment, although that uh, that is very rarely seen in a preterm child in uh, uh, within for a few months of the birth. So I would go with uh, complication of advanced retinobla uh, retinopathy of prematurity. However, the cause needs to be established uh, with the help of a proper examination and uh, ultrasound uh, B scan of the back of the eye to uh, identify the root cause. Thank you. 
and depending on uh, what is responsible the further treatment can be planned so if it is advanced rop and corneal opacity most often the baby would have gone blind and no treatment is likely to help such baby needs to be referred for uh, rehabilitation and if it is a peters anomaly then uh, perhaps uh, keratoplasty uh, may help to restore some vision at least yes great thank you so much um richard um another one please for you um do children with CBI have hypo accommodation with and so need near spectacles as well as some children with intellectual impairment? Yes, it's it's something that's commonly seen in children with neurodevelopmental uh, disability. So it was first described in Down syndrome, and so a lot of children with Down syndrome are in bifocal glasses. Then it was found in cerebral palsy. And that's mainly through special school screening um, vision that that's been found. And ch older children with CP do quite well with um, bifocals. So we thought um, if you're trying to stimulate a baby's vision early, it's all done at near. Mum's face is near. They're looking at their hands. It's near. So maybe let's try and get them into um, near vision glasses early. It can be difficult to measure accommodation in a, in a baby. And if they don't accommodate uh, when you're testing them, you don't know it's because they can't see you or because they can't accommodate. But I often will give them a benefit of a doubt and prescribe some near vision glasses, uh, which also magnify things as well. So if they've got reduced acuity, there's a double benefit there and see how they get on. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. And um, to end with is, is a, a question from uh, Fahir Dean, which is a very broad question, which Dupe has already answered. And that is, what do, what do you think are going to be the most important developments that we can expect that will uh, benefit paediatric ophthalmology over the next few years? So um, Dupe has answered that with um, uh, portable, affordable cameras um, and telemedicine. And I'm wondering whether Sushata and Richard, whether you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah, so uh, can I talk? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, apart from advanced uh, wide field digital cameras, uh, the newer integrated AI systems in those cameras is something that may be a real game changer in your future. So integrated artificial intelligence uh, module would give a diagnosis uh, right at the bedside without uh, having the need for ophthalmologists to go through the images. That is something which is likely to happen in your future. And the other thing that I foresee is a portable optical coherence tomography and portable, portable uh, OCT angiography. Uh, that is also something which may happen in next few years. Yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, what about um, what about you, Richard? So definitely the imaging. You know, I used to spend my time singing to babies or pinning them down or kneeling on the floor to see their retinas. Now I have them all on the screen in front of me before they come in the room, which is a shame in a way, but it's much better for everyone else. But the other big development is gene diagnosis and therapy, molecular medicine. So I'm potentially treating conditions now that when I started ophthalmology, I couldn't even diagnose. So for instance, optic atrophy, we're now able to identify the gene in some cases and inject uh, the healthy gene into the eye uh, and try and improve or save vision from that. So that's a mm. huge um, step forward. Great, so we've got one minute to go. It just remains for me to, to thank the um, the panelists very much and the speakers for some very informative talks and thank you to participants for, for attending and for your interest and for your, your very good questions and comments. So thank you very much. And thank, thank you. And then I'll move to the back or move into the chat. I think they were emailed out as well, weren't they, to Elamine or participants at the end and we would really appreciate your feedback on this webinar. So thank you again. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Claire, for hosting that really good um, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yes.
Thank you so much to all the speakers and, and thank you to everybody for attending today. Um, it's been fantastic to, to hear where you're all from, so many different countries and places. I hope you learned a lot. And if you complete the feedback form, we will ask you what else you would like to know about child eye care so that we can respond to that either with a future webinar or with a future issue of the journal. So thank you again to everybody and goodbye from all of us. See you soon. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.